From robbing stores with a hand grenade to solitary confinement in one of America's most dangerous prisons, it goes without saying that Hollywood staple Danny Trejo understands tragedy more than most. Like many tragic stories, Danny Trejo's begins with an abusive childhood. The documentary Inmate No. 1, The Rise of Danny Trejo, describes how the actor suffered serious abuse at the hands of his father and grandfather while growing up. This drove him closer to his uncle Gilbert, who at least showed him some manner of affection and attention. Unfortunately, his uncle wasn't exactly what you'd call a healthy influence during Trejo's formative years. Under his uncle's guidance, he got introduced to and hooked on drugs. And that doesn't just mean marijuana and a little LSD here and there. It means he started smoking pot at age 8, according to Grantland, and was a full-fledged heroin addict before his 13th birthday. Uncle Gilbert also turned Trejo into a fighter by simply beating him mercilessly and forcing him to stay on his feet or else. Still a young teen, Trejo had a depressingly intimate and knowledgeable relationship with crime and street life. Brutal as his uncle's training was, it did prepare Trejo for a life of crime and incarceration. It also prepared him for life in his corner of Los Angeles, where roaring street gangs brawled over turf like Mission Park. There, Trejo learned that everyone is tough, but not everyone is scary. He said, people ain't afraid of tough guys, people are afraid of crazy guys. Benny the Jet Urquidez, a champion kickboxer, occasionally fought alongside Trejo in this period. The fighter said, Danny never backed down. He was a natural. He had a big heart and a strong jaw. Speaking to Tony Gonzalez, Trejo described the endless physical threats and demands of growing up in Los Angeles' Echo Park. He said, It was trouble. We were from EP, Echo Park, and we always used to fight with the Temple Street Gang, and it was just chaos all the time. You fight on the way to school. You fight on the way home, and you had to keep people out of your neighborhood, which was ours. Unsurprisingly, it didn't take long for Trejo to start getting arrested. His first time occurred at the ripe old age of 10 for assault and battery, but he was just getting started. Those street gang fistfights soon involved firearms, and Trejo was right in the thick of it, firing handguns from rolled down windows during drive-by car-on-car shootouts. And those weren't the only dangerous weapons of war he used during this time period. At different points, he robs liquor stores with actual hand grenades. Don't ask where he got those, but clearly the folks he was running with had some serious resources for their criminal activities. As excerpted by Huffington Post, Trejo remarked, we had a lot of pistols, and you don't really want to mess with somebody who's got a lot of pistols. Years of abuse at the hands of his parents and the terrible influence of his uncle Gilbert had hardened him into a truly frightening hardline criminal by the time he was barely old enough to be trying to pass his driving test. It goes without saying that prison time wasn't too far off. There's cops all over me, man. They're on me like a cheap suit. According to Texas Monthly, Trejo spent 11 years total in various penitentiaries throughout the Southwest. He spent some brief time in prison in 1962 for drug dealing and robbery. He got out before too long, but was back behind bars by 1965, this time for the long haul, after selling four ounces of heroin to a fed posing as a dope fiend, although he maintained it was only sugar. The grueling experience would eventually shape him into the man he is today, but it wasn't exactly what you'd call an overnight process. He was still a hard criminal who wasn't easy to scare. Are you a Mexican or a Mexicant? But that was about to change. In 1966, he was moved to San Quentin, known for its execution chambers. According to the article, Trejo's jovial demeanor changed when the subject shifted to the first time he saw the place up close. He said, when you pull up to San Quentin, you see two lights up on top of the north block. You see a red light and a green light. If the red light is on, that means they're killing someone. That's the first thing you see, so you know this is a death house. People come in here and don't come out. Shortly after being moved to Soledad State Prison, a riot broke out. Trejo didn't start it, but he didn't shy away either, eventually hurling a small rock that struck a prison guard in the head. Trejo insists he didn't mean to hit the guard, but he does take responsibility for the kind of man he was at the time. He said, you can become a bit of a sociopath in prison, and I think I just stopped caring. This incident got him moved to solitary confinement, where he passed the time by recalling his favorite movies like The Wizard of Oz over and over in his head. There's no place. 
The Huffington Post summarizes a 1988 documentary in which Trejo described his thoughts while in the darkness of solitary. I was sitting in the hole and it's like I knew. It's all over. It's just done. I'm through. I'm 24 years old and I'm through. It was then and there that he tried praying for the first time. He told the Guardian, I remember saying, God, if you're there, everything will turn out the way it's supposed to. If you're not, I'm Although he didn't expect to get out of the situation, the charges were ultimately dropped. By 1969, Trejo was a free man. Survivor Net says that in 2010, Danny Trejo was diagnosed with liver cancer. Despite his early years of hard living and age, he wasn't expecting any diagnosis, claiming to have tried to stay healthy over the years. He told The Sun, You know cancer doesn't discriminate. You can be healthy, but it'll still get to you. I had a 10 centimeter tumor in my liver and they said it was too big to start chemo. It's hard enough getting a diagnosis like that. It's another thing to have to keep the news to yourself in your immediate circle. Trejo told the publication that he was reluctant to go public with the disease because he just signed on to some lucrative movie deals. He said, the bad part was I had about six contracts already signed and I was making major money and so I couldn't tell anybody that I had cancer. I always say I had just suffered in silence. But Trejo also said he didn't allow himself to wallow in self-pity. He explained, at first, I thought, God, why me? Then the thought hit me. How would you like to be 12 years old and have cancer? Luckily, the chapter is well behind him. He continued, so they gave me injections right into the tumor three times, seven needles, and boom. So anyway, the third time, after about six months, I came back and they said, you're cancer free. If you or someone you know may be the victim of child abuse, please contact the Child Help National Child Abuse Hotline at 1-800-4-A-CHILD, 1-800-422-4453, or contact their live chat services.